political parties, or finally, becoming a citizen journalist. Um, so if you visit our website, this is a quick screen grab. We offer these five classes, and citizen journalism is one, and we also have a citizen journalism and environmental advocacy online class that you can take. Um, and you may be wondering why citizen journalism, how is that a powerful role? Because knowledge is power. For the public to begin to understand how our communities are neg negatively impacted by pollution or old industrial sites, someone needs to tell the story of what is happening there. The media can help frame the issues in the bigger picture. It's not just one block that's flooding, but maybe it's a whole city that's underwater when it rains. And it's not just one town's polluted river, but that's a waterway that other, that's going to hurt other communities. We're all in this together, and it's the media that can help drive that story and, and can start educating the public. It also can help build a new pool of community advocates for environmental justice. Um, we want to share good news and good deeds that work. We want to also admonish the, the people who are doing bad and when they're polluting the water. This way, we can start building community and bringing people together. And then that way, it'll have a, you know, as you get the coverage out there, as you start reporting the news of what's happening, it creates a snowball effect. You'll get more people involved and more people reporting what's happening. Um, and finally, the media can be used to hold officials accountable. Um, as we like to say, sunshine is the best disinfectant. Um, and I start with the definition of just environmental justice, a positive version. What does it mean? What does it look like to have environmental justice? And I love, this is uh, Bunyan Bryant, who's an academic at the University of Michigan, um, and I love his paraphrasing of it, which is people realizing their highest potential, personal empowerment, and democratic decision making. Um, <coughs> So environmental justice, the realization of environmental justice means that we really face the structural issues that cause the inequality in our society. So that means material inequality, power relations, and, uh, and representation and voice. Um, and these are just little shortcuts for you know, different elements of, in, of justice or in, injustice. You can think about the, sort of the mirror opposite. Uh, there are there's what we talk about often in, in the EJ community as distributive forms of injustice. In other words, the disproportionate amounts of burdens or pollution. And that's often how we hear about environmental injustice. Uh, communities like Newark or Camden or Trenton or uh, you know, communities in the South Bronx, all over the country, all over the world, that are uh, largely low income and uh, people of color. And many of those communities have this, what we call disproportionate amounts of pollution or environmental burden. And they come in lots of different forms, whether that's life, from ground fields, or uh, industries, or the concentration of refineries or chemical companies. Uh, and we see a lot of the media, uh, you know, Louisiana's uh, cancer corridor, or you know, Newark's very own chemical corridor, or the refinery corridor in London. So, Distributive justice is sort of, you know, how we think about not just the burdens, but also the benefits. People also don't remember distributive means that you also, those communities also have uh, disproportionate, uh, disproportionate amounts of environment, lack of environment um, amenities, parks and green spaces and access to healthy food and access to, to transit. And uh, so those are the other side of the burdens. So that's the distributive part. That's the procedural part, um, you know, is access to decision making, and, and, and it's a lot of the decision making processes. People often think of it as sort of public hearings or public participation processes, uh, but it can actually go deeper than that to our representative democracy about how people have voice and their decision making that affects their lives. Um, so it's not just public meetings or you know, hearings. And then there's structural justice, which is a lot harder to define and a lot harder to talk about, but um, in fact is the root of a lot of different types of inequality, economic inequality, environmental inequality. Um, and they're embedded in the patterns of our society. It's, it's about access um, to housing and, and economic empowerment and all sorts of issues that um, we've inherited over long periods of time and are products of lots of different kinds of systems. Um, the fact that some, where someone lives, the zip code where you live, determines how long you will live in this country. That's a disgrace. That's something we should be ashamed, ashamed of. 
not something that um, it should just be brushed off as economic. And part of the reason that that happens, that distribution happens in that way, um, is not coincidental. It's in fact based on a lot of patterns of urban land use, uh, historic patterns of housing, and how we distribute housing, how, who had access to certain types of housing, how we built the transportation infrastructure in this country, how we built public housing in this country, um, and things like racialized redlining policies, uh, housing discrimination, you know, there's a whole set of policies that were state-sanctioned policies all the way up until the 1970s today, probably still rampant in our free, quote, free market system, um, that discriminated against people having have, have a choice about where they live, where they could locate, um, and at the same time, an environmental regulatory system that really picked apart our environment in a way that made it very difficult to have a comprehensive view of environmental pollution. So you put all those things together with deindustrialization, and you've got a, you've got New Jersey, and you know you coincidentally, you know the red where you have the highest um, risk. This is for diesel, you know, this one is for um, diesel pollution, and it's uh, this is a, this is the cancer risk, maybe? Yeah, the diesel cancer risk. Um, that's predicted, and you see that the you know the urban corridor from Newark and Stratton and Hampton are the highest risk areas. Um, they can make the terms of some of that decision making that happens at the table. And a perfect example of this is the state of New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. In the last couple of years, has decided that they're going to open up a lot of rulemaking about environmental laws, and the way they're going to do that is stakeholder processes. And they're going to invite stakeholders from different sectors, you know, the industry, the community, the, you know, the nonprofit. So all the different sectors get representation at the table. They sit around. They can hammer out their differences around what they think the rules should be. And in the end, you should have this big uh, recommendation that the EP considers. The problem with that formula is that that requires a monthly meeting trend that requires the entire day, uh, lots of you know technical review, uh, lots of time, and it also says usually there's only one or two community groups at the table, and there's usually five or six industry people who's like that's their full time job, that they got paid as consultants to do that. That you know, not just that day, but probably for the whole year, two years. So, and you know, so you're often outnumbered. So there's like, recognition of power imbalances in the structure of the uh, structuring of the stakeholder processes. There's no accounting for different levels of um, access to information or resources. Um, so even just because you create a process that on its face looks like it's equal, equal doesn't mean fair. Right? Um, so deepening the way we think about creating more access, more transparency, and also more accountability to decision making. Um, that is really what we need to get to. And this is a great quote, you know, we go to meetings and meetings and meetings and just get meetings to death, you know? And communities, and I'm always shocked, people are always disappointed when you have a community meeting and 20 people show up. I'm always shocked 20 people showed up. I mean, they spent probably 20, 30 years banging their head against going to those same meetings with absolutely no results. And people are smart. Community people are smart. They know that meetings don't result in the actions. They don't have access to decision-making power through that avenue. Um, so, you know, people are going to use their time wisely. And it's always it amazes me that people still continue to try to engage, even though they're not being engaged at a high level. And in New Jersey, in particular, we're in a news desert. I think a lot of people have heard the term a food desert. So in a lot of um, underserved communities, they don't have, they don't have uh, access to fresh, healthy food. Um, there's not the best variety of grocery stores. Um, well, New all of New Jersey is a media desert. We are in the shadow of New York and Philadelphia. Major television uh, coverage is always secondary to New York City and Philadelphia. And then at the local level, um, since, uh, the, 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 since the internet, the news media in general is transforming. And so we have much less local news than we used to. Uh, now we can get national news 
and international news quick and easy and free uh, because there's so many people competing with that same information and you can get that information from anywhere in the world through news aggregators like <coughs> Google and Yahoo. But local news uh, is, is drying up, unfortunately. And so uh, um, Citizens Campaign, among many others, are really trying to push to figure out what is the, ne the, the new way to advance citizen journalism, uh, local news reporting, so that a lot of these issues that we're that we've, that we've been talking about and we're going to talk more about have the ability to be out in the community so that we can educate people about them and so that democracy can function. Um, I was like, uh, these are small particles um, and the problem is they kill. So I'm talking about fine particulate matter air pollution. Fine refers to the size of the particle. Um, and, this, and it's either, you see another name for it, fine particulate matter or PM 2.5. 2.5 refers to the size of the particle. So these are all airborne particles, either solid or liquid, that are less than 2.5 microns in diameter. Just what they sound like, small particles in the air and we breathe them in. You breathe them in right now. You can't, you can't, you can't stop it, they're ubiquitous. And the problem is, the reason that size is important is that these particles are small enough to penetrate deep into your lungs. And they kill you. 200,000, it's been estimated, this is a, this is a um, MIT report paper that came out last year, and they estimate that it causes 200,000 premature deaths in the United States every year. Let me say that again. In the United States, these particles have been estimated to cause 200,000 premature deaths every year. So think how many more people are making sick. They're causing that many deaths. Um, the problem with the particles, two things. That they're physically in your lungs, and the second is a toxic composition. It's almost like delivering a little piece of poison in your body. And I have the composition there, which all, all I really want to say about that is it's toxic. And so anywhere where you see a smokestack is probably emitting fine particulate matter. Boilers. Of course, burning leaves, uh, and very important in urban areas, um, cars, trucks, buses. Trucks and buses, diesel engines, produce more of the particulate matter than cars do. We have to do this. We have to do something on, on our own about this, basically. Um, so, so what's it telling us? Well, cumulative impacts, multiple pollutants from multiple sources of pollution. And this tool has estimated the amount of cumulative, Im cumulative impacts in every neighborhood in New Jersey. Think about it as an estimate of the amount of pollution in every neighborhood in New Jersey. So what's the graph telling you? Well, you have two of them. Right? Up top, you have percent minority. We say percent people of color. The bottom, percent poverty. So what this does is it graphs the amount of pollution in neighborhoods in New Jersey against race and income. Right? The y-axis is pollution. The x-axis, that one is percent people of color. This one percent poverty. And what happens to the amount of pollution as the number of people of color in the neighborhood increases and the number of poor people? It goes up, right? It's almost a straight line relationship. Now, I gotta sit down in a minute. I can say a whole lot about this. I'll just say, I'll just say two things. And I refer to the hidden, hidden, the environmental justice highest things. Well, you know, I, I've come to say, because look, the pollution are in communities of color and poor neighborhoods, right? And this goes against everything we say we stand for. If you're black, you have a, high, a higher chance of having more pollution than if you're white. If you're poor of any color, you have a higher chance of having more pollution than if you have money. And I think what this, what, what this tells us, or the real message here, is that I think this is what makes our system, our environmental system, sustainable for everyone else but people of color and poor people. This is what lets white neighborhoods, middle class white neighborhoods, upper class white neighborhoods, be all right for our environmental system. Because all the bad stuff is going to communities of color and poor communities. So that's what Island talks about, hidden environmental justice. <coughs> this, makes, this makes it sustainable for everyone else, but of course it's not sustainable for people of color and poor people. It's killing them and making them sick. Air pollution is contributing to that. So here are the nine factors that, that the nine uh, indicators I just showed you, you know, that they graph. And you notice that NADA, 
national air toxic assessment diesel is one of them, air pollution, um, particular air pollution, traffic, right, all traffic trucks, air pollution again, benzene again is a different kind of air pollution. So air pollution is contributing to that kind of disproportionate, dis, uh, disproportionate impact on communities of color and poor communities. And those are the environmental justice, right? Those are the environmental justice communities. When we say environmental justice community, community we mean communities of color and poor communities. I'm at minus one. So I'm going to, all I'm going to say about this is that there are policy recommendations that we have developed to reduce air pollution, not only for people of color and poor people, but for everybody. Because guess what? Air pollution travels and it's killing other people besides people of color and poor people. And it's killing, it's killing us at disproportionately high rates. But it's killing everybody. And maybe doing question and answer, we can talk about some of the policy recommendations. Yep. And here's, I'm sure all of you since we're in New Jersey, sometimes I give this presentation nationally, so, but, um, but the issue of Camden City, as you know, one of the poorest cities of the nation, um, is the, the uh, neighborhood that I work in, the waterfront south of Camden is sort of the poster child, or a poster child for environmental justice. Within waterfront south, there's our wastewater treatment plant, which is the third largest plant in the country. There is a trash to seam incinerator, there are 20, uh, designated contaminated sites. There are two super fun sites that are all in one square mile. Um, uh, so there's a picture. For a very long time, environmental justice was environmental just us. And it didn't really make the rounds. People didn't understand what it meant to live in a community where you were targeted because of the color of your skin because of your uh, beliefs or because of your eth ethnicity. And we work in several environmental justice communities now in New Jersey, but there's many, many more that should have a designation and should have resources. Now, a lot of people talk about environmental justice as though it's a volunteer, like it's something that it would be good if people did. That's actually not factually correct. Environmental justice is not just an idea, okay? It is an executive order that was done 20 years ago, today, or this last month. Executive order number 12898. President William Jefferson Clinton signed that order because he recognized that across the country, environmental justice and justice and equity for poor communities fell far short of the vision that our founding fathers had with freedom and equity for everyone. So that order was signed into law 20 years ago, last February. This last month, um, I don't know if any of you had a chance to see it, but you can go online and go and look at um, President Obama's declaration making February Environmental Justice Month. So now, he went, the president went and um, felt that that was so important that it is now, ha you know, alongside, I believe, with, um, with Black History Month is in February as well, it is Environmental Justice Month. And that is a critical step that the president recognized these shortfalls. However, um, there is, after I get, I'm going to talk a little bit about these, uh, these sites, I want to talk a little bit about um, compliance and enforcement, because how do you get environmental justice? Obviously, if you ask for it, we all know that asking sometimes will get you some results. Um, trying to prove a case sometimes gets you results. However, compliance and enforcement are tools that are now in place in the federal government for environmental justice. Many people don't even um, recognize or understand that just recently the US EPA put together a um, compliance and enforcement plan, plan EJ 2014, which is, it's integral, they say, to the 20th anniversary to the programs and policies marking the 20th anniversary of Executive Order 12898 on environmental justice. To protect the environment, to empower communities, establish partnerships with local, state, tribal, and federal governments, and organizations to achieve healthy and sustainable communities. Okay, they also have an enforcement tool, which most people aren't even aware of, advancing environmental justice through compliance and enforcement. 